Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Unleashing Potentials podcast. So joining me today is Helen Ferguson, all the way from France. Hi, Helen. Welcome. Hi, Bernadette. Lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's fantastic. Mm, happy to have you. Um, if you don't mind, you can start by telling us who you are, what you do, and uh, anything from there, your story. Okay, gosh, right. I will try and keep I will I will try and not go off onto a magical mystery tour of, of my whole life. But um obviously I'm Helen and and I am a I'm a specialist trauma therapist and um so my but behind that, if you like, is a a, a number of expertise and therapeutic modalities that that actually kind of underpin that that specialism. So I am an EMDR therapist, I'm a psychotherapist, neurobiological psychotherapist, I'm I'm an internal family systems therapist, I'm a family therapist, attachment therapist. So I've kind of done all these skills, but I've been this now, I've in terms of my work, I've been doing this now for 24 years. So I work with um, and I use the term work, but I actually consider consider it a purpose rather than work. Um, so I've had this purpose now for 24 years, and I work with children and adults to help them uncover and discover who they actually are and who they can become, uh, instead of being defined by the impact of trauma, whatever the trauma is that they've experienced. And usually uh, the people that I work with, like I say, children, adults, um, have experienced childhood trauma, CPTSD and um, and or sexual abuse. So, you know, I, I can be working with women that are 60 years old that um, are just coming to me because they've had a had an experience that has reminded them of their childhood trauma and their sexual abuse in childhood. Um, and I can be working with seven-year-old children that have experienced a sexual um, assault injury or a sexual abuse experience. So, you know, I really work with a, a wide range of um, ages, and um, and it's been it's been such a joy actually to work with the amount of people that I've worked with over the years and to see them flourish. Uh, so my kind of you know, my philosophy is actually leaving a legacy of freedom for people to be who they are and who they want to become in life um, so that they can live with that that freedom and joy and happiness and, and know that it can remain, you know, um, instead of feeling that everything that they've experienced is who they are, because that's not true. What happened, what's happened to you is not who you are. Um, so I, I've been living in France now for six years. Um, I was in Greece before then for seven years. Uh, obviously, by my accent, I'm originally from the UK, uh, but I work internationally. So I I just love being able to kind of travel and live in different places. And, um, and I get to experience and meet so many different people from different cultures in what I do. So... So that's me in a kind of nutshell, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. The work that you're doing is so needed, literally anywhere around the world. Yes. Um, what got you into doing the work that you're doing? I can tell how passionate that you are about what you do. Well, I, I, I never knew I was going to become a therapist. I, I knew... I knew from a young age, I come from a very um, compassionate background. Um, and I knew that, you know, kind of my calling, if you like, was to to be to be there for other people, to help other people. Um, and and so, you know, when I went to university, what, my first degree was was actually in psychiatric nursing. And um, the the kind of pivotal moment of me um deciding to move that into becoming a therapist and doing all sorts of different trainings that people do ask me if I ever if I ever stopped learning and I don't think I should um but um was I was working with children and young people with complex mental health what was described at the time as complex mental health problems and they were um coming into a day unit to be assessed 
uh, and diagnosed, uh, which always sat slightly uncomfortable with me um, because, you know, children of five, six, seven, so on, you know, being diagnosed. But, you know, I remember this little boy and who who was really, really struggling and wasn't allowing anyone near him. He was really, you know, everybody was saying he was so angry and aggressive and all this stuff. And I remember um, having a, a kind of one-to-one -one session with him and, and he, he, he became this lion in this session and, and was kind of roaring at me and things like that. And, and I just stayed with him, you know, this frightened little boy um, that was, didn't know how to express himself, didn't know what to say, you know, was having this expectation that people would, would, would try and understand him. And I just stayed with him and I talked to the lion and I, and I got to know the lion. And I was talking about this session in, in my supervision, which was with a psychotherapist at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was her that said to me, you need to become a therapist. You have this ability to sit with people and understand them and, and want to understand them in a way that is very different from assessing somebody. Um, and so from then on, I started all the work that I've been doing, the learning, the, the academia, um, to learn all the things that, you know, will help me to help other people. Um, so I kind of consider myself a bit of a cross-pollinator of, of skills. I'm like a, a bee cross-pollinating across different flowers. And, and you know, to, to be able to bring um, all of that and myself into, into that relationship with people. So it was that little boy that, that made me, well, made somebody else see in me what I hadn't seen, which was what I am now for other people so it was him <laughs> it yeah. was him and, and yeah, that's beautiful. every every single child and adult that I've worked with ever since then has been a, a validation that that was absolutely the right decision um that it was the right route for me to go um and it is I, I see it as a purpose I absolutely love the value um of it and the value that it gives me as well you know it's important you, that you feel a value in the receiving of what you get from working with with um anyone um so you know there's it's an important relationship the relationship that i have with with anybody that's working with me is hugely important to me yeah absolutely and when it comes to childhood trauma which i think at this point from my experience that all of us have had some type of trauma. Uh, some of us can put label on it. Some of us, we don't understand how to process it. Um, how do you help people process trauma? Um, thank you for explaining how you help that little boy express it. How, how would you help an adult process it if they've never done any type of therapy before? Well, people often think that therapy is really, really scary. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, it, and it's and um, I'm I'm here to break the mold on that because mm -hmm. it's it feels it because you know I think in the past the way that therapy has been seen as has been in a kind of you know the therapist being in a slight ivory tower you know sense of judgment um, those kind of things and I'm not any of that um, because what actually therapy is is an empowering process of transformation um and in the doing of that in the in the in the, the helping somebody in you know have that transformation feel empowered in their own healing journey you know discover uncover and discover who they are and who they can be the very first thing that you have to do and i have to do is create a connection and a co-regulation with that person with whoever's choosing to work with me, whether that's a child, a young person or an adult, um, the very first thing that you have to do is create that connection and co-regulation because it's in that that you help to regulate the nervous system, which has become so dysregulated 
by the trauma that you've experienced and how you've been carrying that, how you've been living that in your body and in your mind and in your heart throughout the 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 time frame that you've been holding on to that until you come into the relationship with me. So that's the very first thing that anybody has to do because that creates this the what you didn't receive at the time at which your trauma happened so the reason why trauma begins to you know the impact of trauma the traumatic experience the reason why it lives in your body is that it affects your brain it affects your uh, you on a cellular level it affects every part of your of, of your being and and so what happens in that in that moment when you experience that trauma your your mind and your body go into survival and that's often understood as the fight flight and freeze um uh the um system and and so you know you can get stuck in that where you've not been the only way that you're able to to manage that is by self regulation and when you are in threat mode, you're not able to regulate your system, you know? So the, the the brain and the body have to create a way of doing that, which is why we see kind of patterns of behavior and, you know, that people say are trauma responses like perfectionism and, and self-sabotage and things like that. But actually what, what they are is the, the, the response, the, the reaction, the trauma reaction is the shame that you feel at the moment of experiencing yeah. trauma. Anything from that, like, you know, the behaviors and patterns that we see, they're responses to the trauma. So what we have to do in the therapeutic relationship, what I do with the people that I'm working with, is we we have to get exploratory and curious. Um, you know, we have to to bring the unconscious to the conscious because you're unconsciously carrying these patterns this shame these core beliefs that you believe of yourself that you're not worthy you're not good enough you're you're um you're bad you know you're bad for this thing happening to you um this idea that if you were someone else then that bad thing wouldn't have happened so you know, by bringing that on un those unconscious patterns to the conscious, you then are empowered to make choices in untangling those knots. You know, I, I always describe it as, um, you know, when you were a kid if, and you had a jewelry box and there was like, a, you know, there was a silver chain and you, you or a chain and you pulled it out of your jewelry box and it was all knotted and tangled together. You know, that's trauma. Okay. So when somebody comes to me and they hand me this, this bundle of knots and they say, can you please help me because I don't know what to do with all of this, we have to gently tease those knots open. So that's the bringing the unconscious, you know, the co-regulation, somebody trusts me, hands me their knots and says, can we do this together? That's the connection. That's the co-regulation. Um, the emotional, being able to witness other people's emotions and not be frightened by them, um, an empathic witnessing. And, mm -hmm. and so we, you know, we then start to tease open these knots, to tease them, you know, and, and gently un unknot them. And so in bringing the unconscious to the conscious, you are, you are making, you are empowering yourself to change the patterns the patterns that have been living in the body in the so we do the soma work we do the somatic experiencing you know helping bring the body um to to a more regulated state so it's not living um in survival mode um equally it's not dissociating um and your brain isn't dissociating out which is you know the far end of the freeze response um but you know what you're able to do is bring a regulation to yourself because that's a, and a balance to what you're feeling. So it's not about getting rid of emotions. Um, it's about being able to, 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 to lessen the impact of those emotions and to, to say those emotions may come back at little gradients, but 
I can I can manage those emotions. They they are. I'm aware of them. I notice them. I respond to them, and I give myself what I need. And bringing in the the emotions of joy and happiness and safety and feeling secure in yourself and knowing that those can remain that then that they won't disappear so it's 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 a very it's a it's a, it's, it's a complex piece of work you know it's it's a complex relationship but ultimately it's it's bringing the relationship back to yourself so that you are you are so connected with yourself you're aware of your needs you're aware of what's happening for you you're making conscious empowered choices of change you're listening to your body you're understanding you know how your body because we feel our emotions in our body be before we're able to say them so if you feel the kind of tightness in your stomach if you feel the rigidity in your neck the stiffness the the, the, the rigid jaw that's that's where your emotions are living you know I got one lady who's working with me at the moment and she said, weirdly, Helen, my shame is in my knee. I don't understand that. You know, <laughs> no, but, you, know there's all other, you know, there's all other emotions when we did a body awareness <clears throat> and body scan, you know. Uh, so I, I use somatic psychotherapy to, to help understand where it's been living um, and how it's been affecting you. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. <clears throat> and we look at the, we look at, you know, the cues of safety and danger um so it's about moving through all of that so that you can uncover who you actually are you know respond to the parts of you that you've really not liked about yourself and you think you know you think oh god you know i need to get rid of those and you spot respond to them with compassion and love and dignity and respect because they've never had that and that needs to come from you uh, yeah. So I lead people into the relationship of self-compassion because we are innately wired for self-compassion and compassion. And I see so many people give it out to others, but turning it inwards on to yourself, this, this kindness, this, this humanity that you can give yourself, um, mm -hmm. it's really difficult for people to do because they've been spending so much of their life judging and criticizing themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure shift all of that around yeah thank you for sharing everything you did um i believe you um i i have my own trauma and and things that i've been working through i love the the way you describe it with the knot because i'm going through it and i know i'm not alone i'm, I'm kind of pulling different parts of the knot but it wouldn't work it wasn't coming undone like i expected it to or wanted it to and um trauma is so complex as you as you've expressed because it's um it's facing our shadows and uh facing things we don't want to and most of the time it's so unpleasant to face and to go through it and that's why i appreciate what you do because you help guide people um to know where to start, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you give them a, the space and over time they can build a trust because if there's no trust, one cannot open up, right? That's why um, therapy seems scary to many because you're going to go see a stranger, tell them all everything about your life or some of it. It's scary. And I love how you build the, the trust and how you invite people and the methods that you used. Um, what is CP? So you put it in the abbreviation. PTSD is, yes. is, so you have PTSD and CPTSD. So um, mm. PTSD is complex. PTSD. I have that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, no, PTSD we would we would usually describe as coming from one incident. So um, an experience of um, a car accident, um, a medical injury, um, um, war in the sense of you know a a a, a battle, um, and complex PTSD we understand more as a a series of trauma that um, 
has been ongoing or there has been more than one. So we would often use it to describe um, anyone who's had abuse, neglect um, in childhood, and that's been an ongoing process within within the family or within a relationship, um, a parental relationship or a, or a caring relationship, um, or you know somebody outside of the home. So there's there's like um, it's 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 not just obviously childhood trauma, but we understand it that it, it usually originates in childhood in childhood, um, and it's it's a, it becomes a series of traumatic experiences that happen over a, over a, a number of uh, episodes a number of years a number of months um and can re can have a um again in in young adulthood and uh, if you experience a trauma then that adds to it so the complexity is the complexity of all these all this this trauma that you've experienced that hasn't just come from one incident mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> with me, maybe I'm not alone. I get flashbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be from a stranger, from smelling something, uh, from anything. And then I used to lash out, not understanding that the person who triggered me did yeah. not intend to cause me harm or pain. How can we work with our triggers without hurting those around us that are trying to help us because triggers are very real and they are. They're, they're real yeah how can we do that and I think I think it's important to to kind of there's two, there's a couple of ways of looking at tri triggers there's mm -hmm. the way there's a way of looking at them when they are you know um when they're not causing you to dissociate and become so angry or so frightened but there's a so there's a way of looking at them that you can understand them as messages um and messages mm -hmm. to what to what you need so if something is if something has triggered you and you you feel that but it's not you haven't got you know think of them as a spectrum um that you haven't gone into this dissociation into the the severe flashbacks but you can understand I understand that I am feeling this right now because of of that of that episode, because of that person, because of that scent, because of that program, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And then of course, there's the flashbacks and the tree and it's right that from the from triggers that that people experience. And in fact, I have a, a group of women that I'm working with at the moment. And and today, in fact, they messaged and said, How can I deal with this flashback that I've been experiencing? <laughs> So they've got a session with me tomorrow. Um, so we're we're looking at all of that. But um, it is you know, awareness, bringing your awareness to your triggers, understanding them, so that you you can begin to think about the ways in which you can not avoid your triggers necessarily. There is obviously some benefit in 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 trigger avoidance, but mm -hmm. also understanding what is it that I need in order to manage this situation because it's not going to be the first or last time that I experience this trigger you know mm -hmm. um so it's about having that awareness of yourself and awareness of what may um may be a trigger point for you mm -hmm. understanding that on on lower end of spectrum scale they are messages and messengers to what you need so you can listen to those and think okay how do I now that I'm, you know, if, if you're in therapy or you've gone through therapy or anything like that, that you can think, okay, how can I manage this situation? I'm, I'm feeling stronger in myself. What is it that I need? What do I need to do in order to help myself feel safe? Because the trigger is there letting you know that you're not safe. That's what a trigger does. And so, and your brain at any point so okay i'm trying to not go I'm, I'm going to try not to go into two depths of neuroscience but you have oh, a, no, sorry <laughs> you have a part of your brain called the hippocampus okay so when you're when you're in your traumatic moment when you're experiencing your trauma not the not afterwards but when you're experiencing your trauma there's parts of your brain that have to have to shut down in order for um for you to 
try and self-regulate, try and manage that situation. Mm -hmm. So the part of your brain that has to shut down is the rational part of the prefrontal cortex. And so when that has to shut down, because there's no rationality to trauma, okay? Mm -hmm. So your prefrontal cortex goes, nothing I can do for this because I don't understand it because it's not rational. Um, but there's another part of your brain that, that has to come in to help try and regulate, to try and manage, okay? And that's where kind of the fight, flight, freeze comes from. But the other part of your brain that is also activated is the hippocampus. And it's the memory making part of your brain. And it's the hippocampus that becomes activated when you experience your trigger. Because any situation, any experience, any sense, sight, sound, touch that activates the hippocampus into thinking that you are back in that dangerous position, it will activate all the other parts of you in order to manage that situation. So your rational brain will shut down again and your, your emotional brain, the emotional part of your brain will, will come into play to try and regulate. So it's, so that's why when the hippocampus goes, oh, right, we're in this situation again, here we go. And that's when your fight flight and freeze and fawn come, come back in. So your whole system then goes into threat mode. Okay. And that's why triggers are really, you know, on some level really important because when you know what they are, you can start to rewire your brain to understand that they, that they're not a threat anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could see our triggers as friends instead of enemies. And I find that um, just trigger or PTSD at times there's a, a very heavy stigma that is placed on it by society, which makes it very hard then for those who truly need the help to access it. I wasn't always open about what I'm going through. I, I know lots of other people, they're not open, not because they necessarily don't want to. It's the culture they grew up in, uh, the environment that told them it wasn't okay to express how you feel. Maybe it's uh, during childhood, right? As you mentioned, childhood um, trauma plays a significant role into how we see life now, right? Um, do you find that it's easier or harder for male uh, to open up versus female? We, we talk a lot, but how is that, <laughs> right? Because we raise in the in the society where males are macho. They're not supposed to cry or feel. How do you work with different males? And how does, how does that work? If, <laughs> because, because, everyone, because, because everyone is unique, okay? So your trauma, everything... Mm -hmm. The impact that your experiences had on you will be unique to you and you alone. Mm -hmm. it, you can be in a sibling group and have the same experience, so the same episode, the same abuse, but the way that it's impacted on you will be different because you are unique. Mm -hmm. That's the same in how it continues to affect you in your life. And then, of course, there's the cultural, the gender issues the, the 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 societal expectations the gender expectations the non-gender expectations etc cetera, etc cetera, that go with that now i've worked with some amazing men over the years that have managed that have come in been really open about what they're experiencing really open about the connection with me um this is what they want this is and, and i think that's also you know helped by what they've experienced of support in their life. Um, and, but there's other men that have come to me that have been not resistant, but more closed off. And that, and you know, that's, you, that's I'm gonna be a little bit specific now, but that's, that's that, that has been <coughs> men jobs like the police um, and, and firefighting where there is this kind of sense of you have to hold on. And, you know, my my husband is, is ex-military. So he was in the military for 24 years. He went to Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Bosnia, Northern Ireland, the trouble in Northern Ireland. You know, he's seen a lot of 
um, devastation and being a part of that. And um, he's, you know, when I sit with him and think about everything that he's been through, I'm always amazed by how together he is, how safe he feels in himself. But that's that's also because of the support he had then in that process, but also, you know, obviously I don't therapize him, um, but the, <laughs> the support he's had in his adult life, you know, so he had a good foundation, he had a good, safe and secure attachment foundation, emotional bonding with his family. He went into these scenarios, he had a good set of, of um, support structures and then he came out of the the marines and you know he he married me um so you know he's, <laughs> he's he's done well for himself but that's not you know that's not everybody's story okay um so if you have not you know so for example there's a guy that i was working with that didn't have that strong family foundation you know was was abandoned as a child um, his emotional needs weren't met. He's had to self-regulate. He's had to try and do that through, and he tries to, has did try to do it through drinking and smoking and overeating and then over-exercising and all the things, all these patterns that were showing up. Um, but he was, you know, initially very resistant to working with me because um, he's in a job that says you don't do that, you don't share. So there's so many different factors that can contribute. And, and I see that in women too. You know, there are, there are women that, that come to me. I mean, the one thing that everybody has in common when they first start to work with me is the amount of shame that they're feeling about what they've experienced. And, and it's shame that makes you try and hide. It's shame that makes you, you know, that drives you to to those self-sabotaging i hate the term self-sabotaging but i'm going to use it on this occasion those self-sabotaging kind of behaviors that, and the beliefs that you have about yourself but you know i see it in women too some women are really open you know they're open to to the potential for the the transformation um they 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 develop they go into the trusting relationship um, quite smoothly and allow it to happen and embrace it and then there's other women that are you know I'm I'm not sure you know I, I need to keep a keep a distance first and I you know there are so many contributing factors to all of that it's it's the foundations that you had when you were when you were children um, it's the continued emotional um and emotional connections that and peer connections that you had as young people into adulthood. And, and it's the, the meaning making of the world around you. It's where you see yourself in the world and the value that you give yourself. And all of that contributes to your ability to be able to, to feel like you can engage in, in this, in this, this safe relationship, this probably the most, you know, life-changing relationship you'll ever have where I don't see resistance so much is in children. Yeah. Children kind of come in and I saw a little boy this morning um, and it's his first time of seeing me and we were talking about, you know, we were getting to know each other and, and you know, he was, he, he was just open and, you know, explained, he'd experienced sexual abuse and he explained what had happened. Um, and we were, you know, we were talking about how, you know, how, you know, to help him feel magical. And he turned to me and he said, I'm already magical. And I said, absolutely, you are, you know, absolutely, you are. If we could harness that, bottle that and give it to everyone. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> you know, so I see with children a very different, um, you know, non-gender, non-societal, you know, this, this just ch a child in a room just wanting help. Um, I'm not saying I've never seen resistance in children. Of, of course I have. Um, I used to work with children and young people that were that were no longer with their birth families. And so, you know, I there was a there was a lot of work that we needed to do to help, you know, them begin to trust this relationship with their foster carers. Yeah. Um, but there's so many different factors that contribute to the ability to say and accept 
and connect with the idea of receiving help and support and that it can change your life. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. We're going to go where we should always go. <laughs> uh, when it comes to sexual abuse, sexual trauma, obviously it varies for everyone based on what they've been through a culture. I experienced that as a child, as an adult, and sort of recently. Um, growing up, even in school, talking about sex, it's something we did not do. Probably still don't in my country, right? It's taboo to open up about stuff like that. So for me, I was ashamed always of talking about it. Even going to school when I came to Canada, studying about different body parts, having to study with other classmates, right? Let's start with um, childhood sexual trauma. How can that impact someone's uh, sexual life as an adult? It can it can affect it in a number of ways, um, you know, and and it's and it, like I said, it is it is unique to the situation and unique to to that child and young person. Um, how it affects there's you know there's some people, some children, some young people, when they've been abused in in childhood, is that they, they they go um, into this kind of over exploration over curiosity about sexuality mm -hmm. um and i've had children and young people being described as promiscuous as a result um that's not what it is it's not promiscuity it's an, it's it, it's this trying to make sense of this this experience that happened to you at a young age mm -hmm. and explore whether it was right or not you know if you've never had anybody explain to you that what happened to you should never have happened to you, that it was not normal, that it's 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 not something that children and young people um, should have happened to them, then you will try and make sense of that experience in whatever way that you that you do. Um, and what people describe as promiscuity in in adolescence and young womanhood or young adulthood, I, I'm ex I'm not going to exclude men on this either, um, is that they will try and make sense of that experience. They'll also try and make sense of what love is. Um, so they will seek that because often that intimate abusive act has also been has has had words of um, love said so child um, grooming and sexual abuse has often have words of love said not the act obviously not the feeling so this really distorts the idea of what love and sexuality is and and what sensuality is so this this exploration this curiosity this promiscuity that people describe it has yeah. it's really a meaning making process trying to make sense of who you are in the world in relationships in intimacy what love means mm -hmm. there are other people um that don't do that they retreat into themselves intimacy becomes even with themselves even the act of washing yourself feels too intimate because of what you've experienced so you've got those polar opposite ends of the, the scale and, and the spectrum and everything in between. And it's really kind of, you know, the shame that comes with the idea that as a teenager and a young woman, you're promiscuous, you know, and then the shame of not being able to, to feel um, safe with touching your own body. So it's really uh, like, I mean, this is where it's all complex as well, but this is where it's, it's this large spectrum. So, you know, those knots I was talking about, mm -hmm. it's understanding those. Because yes. I've got women that say to me that they can't, you know, they're in their 40s, 50s, and they can't, you, you know, they have to kind of close their eyes in order to, in order to dry themselves after a shower. 
you know they won't they won't touch their 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 breast or their <clears throat> they won't touch, you know they won't you know touch the themselves in any intimate way um and and there's women mostly women on this one that I would work with in terms of how they can bring that level of self-intimacy back to themselves mm -hmm. with safety and those women those young women that have have been exploratory and curious about sexuality intimacy relationship um in a way that hasn't been safe how they can bring safety to that because because you know people will also if they're aware of that and and it's other people using the term promiscuity not me if people are aware of that promiscuity you end up with that label too you know that's who you are you know so women have come to me deep in shame because not only have they had this terrible experience and ordeal as a child as a young person as a young woman um or as an, an adult when when i when i've worked with rape victims um that you know not only do they have that shame they then have the shame of the label that goes with it yeah yeah i agree and um I love what you're doing and that's kind of why I love also what I'm doing because I've been through all of those and I'm still going through them and I I truly understand the heaviness of shame that ties to not only sexual trauma but trauma in general and all the labels and we can easily become those labels if we don't know who we are, right? If we can't exactly. find if we're lost in years or decades of of who we're not and who we're told to be um in my case it started as a child and then throughout it's like a, a a wreck right it's just one thing after another it never stopped and it's having the courage to go deeper even when i'm afraid right to just go deeper um i feel that if i can help anyone i don't know wherever they may be watching or listening then i've done my part right because um it's good to hear uh things that happen from people that have experienced them uh not necessarily in a, if a doctor or therapist have experienced that's their own personal stuff but if there are communities because people feel alone it's yeah. a very dark lonely place to be in um, how can we find community and not go to judgment so quickly? It, you know, I always say that healing happens in safe relationships. I love that. The, safe, you know, the safest relationship you will ever have is the one that you develop with yourself. Mm -hmm. So you know when you said that you, you know, when you're when you're frightened, when you're at your most frightened, um, that kind of feels the hardest time. That's the time when you need yourself most, mm -hmm. when you bring compassion to that. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, there are communities, there are, um, there are, you know, and they don't have to be communities of women or, or adults or, or that have been through exactly the same thing. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's, it's your community, it's your people, you know, that you feel safe with mm -hmm. and, and you know that can be you know your church group or if you're in you know if you're religious it can be your friendship group it can be as small or as big as you want it to be but you know it's whoever you feel the safest with and then whenever i'm um working with anyone we look at the values that you have of you but also of life you know and we look at who you have around you. I always describe it as like, um, like you're a planet, okay? And you've got this gravitational pull, you've got this orbit, okay? And this gravitational pull of people and, and the people that are in the closest orbit with you are your community. They are the people that will help you feel the safest because their values are so aligned with yours that they would never want to break those. They would never want to step onto those boundaries or, you know, and step on your values. There's a connection. And in that, 
that's where healing happens. You can also, there are so many, you know, one of the things I have is a, is a community of women that, that work with me. It's a, the Women Rising community. And um, the connections that they have with each other are amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, and these are women that had never met each other. They're in different parts of the, they're in different parts of the UK. I don't think if there's anybody American in there at the moment, but um, they're in different parts of the UK um, and had never, have never been in a room together. But they're they're in my community and they're in my membership and they're and they are I what you know they have their sessions with me twice a week and then I see all this connection that happens between them in you know in between the sessions that they have with me and I'm like you know that's what it's all about so if you can find that and there's only six women you know but if you can find one person one woman one man you know one person who's your person that's the start of your community yeah. and that's all it takes it's hard when we're by ourselves exactly. or when we feel that we're alone when really yeah. we're not but once we overcome the obstacle of feeling that we're alone and lonely and and having community yeah yeah i've had amazing com conversation and connection with people i've never met why? Because they can relate to my story, because they encourage me and empower me, and it's having that. Um, let's stay on the topic for a little longer about sexual abuse, uh, because it's a big one. I would like to talk about how authority, uh, government, or different le legislation can help and support anyone experiencing sexual abuse and trauma. I won't even specify it to girls and women because men experience that as well. What are some tools and things that can be put into place to protect people, to provide resources? I think it's a, it's a very, very big subject. It's a very big subject. Yes. Um, you know, and, and of course, you know, worldwide, it's a huge issue around child protection, um adult protection and and you know what what's the what's the um what's the word i'm looking for what's the action that happens as soon as you know that somebody has experienced or is experiencing this um and it's you know there there are you know there are failings in in a lot of a lot of the, I mean, it's certainly when I think about the UK, for example, you know, that's that's where my knowledge lies, you know, on, rather than a, in America or in 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 Greece. I mean, there are European child protection laws and and adult protection laws and legislation. It's having it's having the capacity to to uphold those. Um, and if you've got structures that are failing because you're you haven't got the skill set in those services to meet the needs of a child that is at risk or an adult who is at risk or has been at risk, then you're then you you're going to fail that person. You know, it's not the people themselves. It's you know if you haven't got robust skills people in you know implementing those acts implementing those structures implementing those reactions and responses to what what happens um when somebody is experiencing that or has experienced thing that you know shifting away from victim culture shifting away from um the i you know the you know the what women have to go, particularly, um, I'll use on this occasion, you know, the, the, what women have to go through when they go to court. Um, yeah. When, you know, there's there's a real, you know, things do have to change. And that is about knowledge. That is about being much more, it's more than being trauma informed. It's being trauma aware and looking at things through a trauma lens. Um, 
it's having the trauma knowledge and the trauma skill set. Now, the difficulty is trauma covers such a wide, you know, trauma is a big word, a small word rather for a big lot of trauma. <laughs> you know so yeah. medical trauma there's there's you know there's sexual trauma there's you know abuse there's not you know there's so many things that you know come under this umbrella of the name trauma but when you have a when you have skilled and knowledgeable people with expertise in this area not not just a not not only a will to help but you know a trauma focus looking at things through a trauma skilled lens then you are able then to respond to people differently in the way that in the way that means that we don't add to the shame and yeah. you know without without me going for world domination <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be able to talk about all countries around you know their legislation and what needs to happen but you know on a general level understanding bringing awareness, bringing skill and knowledge and expertise to people who are on the front line of it, but also the ones making the laws mm -hmm. and also the ones who are sitting in court and, and, and asking the questions and, and making the judgments. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, with me, the incident that happened to me this year, um, it triggered a lot for me because it's been, it's going to be over a year with court stuff. Um, I haven't received counseling or any other resources. Um, it's tricky. It's hard. And that is why uh, many times it's hard to get help or accept help because women like me or other people who's experienced uh, any type of trauma, sexual abuse, we feel that the system failed us. Um, in my case, you know, back in Haiti where it happened, I was adopted and it happened in foster care and, and, and so on. I felt that my innocence was taken away from me without me giving it right? And I used to be very angry, still am a little bit, right? And um, with that anger, shame. Shame is a big one. And I love, love that you talk about shame because it's a really, really big one. If we could break the barrier of shame, then we can work on other improvements or things that people need. Exactly. I mean, you know, shame is born out, toxic shame is born out of trauma mm -hmm. and that and that traumatic experience. You know, we we should you know, collectively around that person, around you, around me, I've experienced trauma, you know, we collectively should not be adding to that. Yeah, yeah. We should yeah, be absolutely. responding with compassion to that mm -hmm. and empathy and and a common humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, what is already, you know, a, a becomes a core part of you, shame. And develops into kind of this toxic shame that just overrides the belief that you have in yourself and who you are and who you can be. If that's then added to by by people around, then then that is compounding the belief that you that you that you have about yourself. And we 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 can't do that. That does need to change. People need you know we need people around us that that you know respond with compassion respond with empathy respond with acceptance that you are feeling the way that you're feeling so coming from a place you know without judgment without criticism because those judgments and criticisms if they happen in childhood or young out young young adolescence and young womanhood young adulthood then that that moves with us they become yeah. these statements that we believe about ourselves because we've heard it so often that it's true. And we'll look then for the truth of it and we'll make that truth happen. We'll find the proof. Yeah, yeah. And um, the heaviest type of shame and the most painful one for me that cuts so deep that is taking time to heal. Maybe other people who's watching or listening have the same is when your family shame you, when your friends shame you, 
Um, it could be gaslighting saying, get over it already. It's been that long. When they don't realize that you need the actual work and to go at your pace, right? Healing is not a race. It's um, putting in the work and doing what we can with what we have. Um, yeah, so it's hard dealing with family shame. Is is that something you you heard or seen quite a bit? You know, family shaming family members. Yeah, because there's a there's I mean that you know there's so many factors that contribute to that. You know, there's fear, there's there's disbelief, there's there's avoidance. You know, there's so many you know lots of different things that contribute to that. Um, but what what you what we have to do, you know, in in a lot of ways is is reparent that part of us that didn't receive the support and compassion and love and dignity that and respect to to minimize that shame that we originally felt. And so in, in any kind of healing, and you're right, healing is not a race, you know, and and healing isn't linear, it's all over the place. You, you know, it's um it's it's also a journey it's not a destination you know yes. yeah. and yeah. and so you know as part of that healing the whole healing process for yourself and ourselves when we experience these things is to reparent that part of us that didn't get the response that we needed at the time at which we shared disclosed you know you know expressed what what had happened um and because we can't go back we can't change the response of other people and it's okay to be angry with that you don't have to forgive other people for for not giving that to you um you what you what you can do is forgive yourself for which believing. can be so hard <laughs> yeah I, I can relate it's so hard to forgive because yeah. uh, it's finding the, pulling out the self-love uh, that we know we have. Without that, it's so hard to get in uh, forgiveness and, and so many other things. Um, let's go over some terms. <laughs> Maybe I've heard of them or don't really know what they mean. What is a psychotherapist? Let's say someone's watching, listening. They don't know what it is. <laughs> Well, I tend to not use the term really um, okay. because a, I don't like the term psycho. <laughs> oh yeah, um, me too. A ther yeah. Therapist. <laughs> I'm a therapist. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, psychotherapy is is in its Latin means soul searcher, oh. and so that is you know when when we think about you know what a psychotherapist does is we 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 it we do help search in the soul because that's what a psychotherapist does is bring the unconscious to the conscious mm -hmm. um it's a you know that psychotherapy has changed a lot over the years and there's so many different areas like you know i work with somatic psychotherapy and i work um with neurobiological so mind body um and emotion mm -hmm. and so, you know, but i i think you know the, the term the, the words I you know I'm I am a psychotherapist it's what I try I trained in um and you you know to become a psychotherapist we usually I think it's changed a little bit over the last couple of years but what we had to have was a was um a foundation in mental health and well-being so um you couldn't become a psychotherapist unless you'd done for example a social work degree or a um, um you'd done your psychiatry or you know you'd done your psychology degree um so psychotherapy was you know is a is a way in which we understand help people understand their souls their mind their body you know everything that's happening unconsciously um so that we can help um undo the knots and you know, like I say, everybody works differently. I remember psychotherapists when I was first training, and I was thinking, I'm not entirely sure I'd come to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, so I, I actually, yes, I'm psychotherapy trained, but I'm, I'm, um, 
I'm I kind of feel as though I'm much more of a kind of holistic therapist in mm-hmm. the sense of you know all the other training that I have all the other therapy um, skills that I have so I you know I'm a mind body soul therapist that's what I am um, and um, so yeah but psycho the, the psycho bit of psychotherapy I think we can you know it's just it's an unfortunate term because of course the word psycho is now used as, as a derogatory term for for people I've been um, called that right yeah. and that's why because of my wounds and pain and how they were inflicted i'm so passionate about helping people yeah. um i used to be so ashamed of sharing my story i have schizophrenia ptsd uh, i have so many other labels they put on me um but many times we fail to see the true person that's in front of us instead we go to labels that were given to them versus some people don't even they don't even call people by their names, right? Um, yeah, let's talk about language. You know, the word psycho, I'm personally allergic to it. I don't like it. If someone called me that, I've, yeah. I've, I've grown enough, I have thick skin to let it slide. But to someone who who's fresh in their um, trauma, that can really uh, cut them very deep. And it can, it can hold them back. Very it can be very off-putting because yeah. it says, you know, the word psycho, because it's, you know, it's something that has over the years had a lot of derogatory um, meaning to it instead of it's, it's kind of true meaning, which is looking at the psych, um, mm-hmm. you know, looking at, you know, observing, being empathic, uh, an empathic witness to everything that's happening in your, in your, in your psyche, in your mind, mm-hmm. body and soul. And and so instead, it's been used as a as a your psycho, meaning you're mentally ill. So people instantly think that you know, um, you know, coming to a psychotherapist might mean that you're mentally ill, and it's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And mm-hmm. and so yeah, it's it it is it it has. I mean, it's not about. It, but I've not had people refuse to work with me or anything like that. Or it's. Um, but I tend to use, you know, trauma therapist as opposed to as opposed to psychotherapist because okay. it just breaks that wall down. You know, yeah. it says, it says what I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm a therapist that works with trauma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's touch a little bit on suicide. <laughs> um, you see, I'm speechless because I I have been in the past and I know. Many other people may have felt it or, you know, tried to hurt themselves. I find that there's a very heavy stigma, not only on mental health or trauma, but on suicide. Um, Obviously, if anyone needs help to get it, uh, most of the time, from my experience, if I tell anyone that's how I felt or feeling, that's me crying for help. That's me saying, Hey, please listen to me. Can you talk to me? Can you help me? Can you get me some resources? Do I want to do it? No. I have kids. I have things that I have to live for. I actually want to live. But we can quickly shift that into a threat when really it's a cry for help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it is. It's, a, you know, it's a, you know, there are, there are people that end their own story because that's what it is it's ending their their own story and and if you truly want to kill yourself you will you know it um sometimes it doesn't you know sometimes people can't find that help or want to seek out that help they they want to no longer be here um but you know if where they're where somebody is looking for help and is saying, you know, this is what I'm feeling in my mind right now. This is what I'm feeling in, in my heart and my my body. And and it's, re- you know, it's really painful. And, you know, I've got this feeling that I want to end it. You know, there's a suicidal ideation as opposed to an intent. Um, then, then, you know, you know, being able to share that is hugely important, being able to reach out. Um, and that is back to looking who's in your community, who's yeah. who's in your circle that you feel safe with. And if there isn't anybody, 
there are so many organizations where you can pick up the phone. Um, Samaritans in the UK, for example, um, suicide prevention um, organizations in the US that I'm that I'm aware of. You know, there are there are organizations that are trying to support. So it's, it's feeling able to acknowledge that you've been having those thoughts. You feel scared by them, but you aren't alone and that you can reach out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's, yeah, it's having somewhere to, like a refuge place, you know, because even though we can be sheltered in our own home and space and have love, family, money, we can still feel so trapped and unhappy and have nowhere to turn. Um, an example of the saying, money can't buy you love or happiness. Is it true? I think it is. Because some of the richest people in the world, they're miserable. They don't have love or or healing or peace, right? It's having the community, which I love what you're doing. Um, do you have any final thoughts or words of encouragement for, uh, for the listeners before I let you go? I think, you know, I think what I'd like to say is, is, it, you know, if you're listening and you're feeling alone, I want you to hear that you're not. Um, that there, you know, that it can, the trauma makes you feel like you're on your own. Because that's, you know, in the moment when you were experiencing it, you were. Um, but that's not to say that you are now. And there are so many people that have experienced what you have experienced and 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 have been struggling to and have reached out so you know you really aren't alone and and look look for the support look for the help it's there you know and and people will reach out to you people you you will be surprised at the at the support and help that you you can receive yeah, yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, t to always get help, um, no matter how hard it is. Um, I know that so many of us, we have so much to live for and don't cut it short, right? Take it from me <laughs> and from H Helen as well for sharing. Uh, thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, what an honor and blessing it was to talk to you. Uh, where can my listeners find you if they would like to work with you? There, well, there are several places. If you want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I'm on Instagram as Helen B. Ferguson. And Facebook, you can um, go to my Facebook Helen Ferguson therapy page. Um, if you wanted to connect with me, you can um, go to my website, helenbferguson.com, and you are able to sign up to my newsletter. I do a weekly newsletter with advice and support and guidance. That's that's probably the, the coolest way to start with me. You become we become inbox friends. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I provide yeah. a lot of I love, provide a lot of advice and guidance and support in those in those emails and a, little, a lot of inspiration that you're not alone in, in, and it's a community. People reply to me all the time to my emails. Um, and that's the coolest way to connect with me. Um, and, but you can also book on a, on a free compass call if you're wondering what direction to go in. Well, thank you so much, Helen, for being on the podcast and for sharing what you do. And thank you for help, helping others, so many others healing. It's a beautiful, powerful job that you're doing. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. And everybody, is, you know, who I've ever worked with, it's been a joy to work with them. Mm -hmm. and, like, Thank you. 